I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone. I want to go a little bit deeper mm-hmm. into like the music industry. You talked about the masters, the publishing, publishing yeah, um, the 360 deals and things of that nature. A lot of times we don't understand the, the actual business side. Our, our artists, they just want to create. They don't want to worry about that. Um, and I think one of the most relevant videos I can think about is whenever Joe Button was talking to yeah, Lil, Lil Yachty. Yachty. And Lil Yachty was like, man, I'm just trying to have fun, bro. Like, I ain't worried about all of that shit. Two years later, you are in QC. And, and you know, Q, Coach K, he's from Nap, man. And Indianapolis, we don't have many. So I go, I go t- 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 talk about him bad too much. But I'll post that video on my feed. First of all, it's hilarious. <laughs> but it's a it's a generation gap too, man. Like a lot of people, like Joe Button, he comes from that generation of, of tough love, right? Mm-hmm. So somebody yelling at you. You don't hear them yelling. You hear the message. And now the generation now, they aren't used to that, right? So the delivery wasn't really there. But everything he was saying was spot on because little Yachty didn't read his contract. Um, I think Rich Homie Quan, when I'm not trying to shit on him on this interview, but I think he said the same thing. He didn't read his contract. I think I saw some other day, Megan, she didn't read her contract. Mm-hmm. If, if you've ever sat down and read a music contract, who the fuck can read that shit? Like, if you're not a music attorney, and you didn't go to law school for this, those terms are crazy. And so and I don't blame the artists, man, because if I'm from an area where the average median income is under 25000 and I'm sharing draws with my brother, and I got holes in my shoes that are three sizes too small, and all I got is these thoughts in my head, I'm able to put them onto a beat, and somebody wants to offer me $100,000, bro, I don't even know what the fuck masters are. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. I know what $100,000 is, though. So I'm not mad at them for the people at that era. But now we definitely need to know because going back to what I was saying, the reason you're seeing all these catalogs being bought or the reason Seagram's bought Interscope Records is for those masters. Masters, anytime music's getting paid, played, somebody's getting paid. Mm-hmm. And so whoever owns the masters owns the publishing, they're going to get paid off of that forever. Mm-hmm. So, like, I don't even know if the Star Spangled Banner has masters or if it does. Or No, that's probably not a, a good example. Like, any Elvis song, right? Elvis is going to get played forever. Mm-hmm. Whoever owns his masters, if it's his estate, you're going to get paid off of that. It's a revenue-generating asset that never stops. Mm-hmm. That's why they want it so bad. And black people, we just been giving away, like, M&Ms. Mm-hmm. So can you can you break down the difference between masters and publishing? Yeah, so masters and it's and it's kind of weird. So it goes back once again. So when you were recording on analog, which was like the tape decks back in the sixties and seventies before all this all this digital stuff, right? You had to actually use tape. Tape was super expensive, and so when you got done you had the final copy, which was the master copy. Mm. And then you would duplicate du- duplicate other versions or the ones that you want to sell to the public off of that master. Do y'all know what them duplicates were called? Mm. Slaves. What? Wow. Go look it up. Masters called slaves. And slaves. That's crazy. Yes. Wow. So your master recording, and then you had the slaves, which is the ones that would go to the stores and all that. Whoever was the producer or the owner of that, you own that mass recording. That is in my vault. That is mine. Okay. So if I help write the song, like, all right, well, hell, you own the master recording, but like I wrote, okay, well, let's invent this thing called publishing, right? You helped write. So now there's when you whenever there's a song, one half of it is a mass recording, the other half of it is a copyright with the with the publishing. And most independent artists, we own both. But if you're signed to a label, they usually will own the masters while you'll maintain your publishing unless you give that away. So it sounds weird, but it's like two different entities for the same thing. But mm. when you get an advance, if you ain't read your contract, you'll give away your master, you give away your publishing, give away your royalty. Some people give away their name, their logo, their everything. Damn. Damn, that shit wild as a motherfucker. I'm glad you broke that down too, because I never really fully understood the difference between masses and publishing. Like I always, it always was a gray area for me. It sounds like publishing is just a a a hush puppy for artists. Honestly, like hey, I own the big thing, but we'll give you a little little something. And 
I, I also heard you say, you know, you can own your masters, your rubble, your publishing, and then there's royalties. So can you explain how you get paid off of those three? Yeah. So this is for every artist. This is going to be the gem of the interview. There's four things that you need in order to make sure you get 99% of your money. The other 1%, I mean, if somebody plays your song in Tanzania or some random streaming service, some dude invented his hut, like, and I'm not trying to be racist, but I ain't never been there. You know, you're not going to get that money. So you need a distributor. So a distributor is uh, CD Baby, DistroKid, TuneCore, United Masters. You got to have your music through them. They're going to put your music on all platforms. You got to sign up through a distributor. And they're going to collect royalties off, off of that for you. The second thing you need to have is a performing rights organization. So BMI, ASCAP, or CSAC. And those are the ones that collect your publishing money here in the U.S., and in Canada, if a CSAC. The third thing you need to have is Song Trust. They collect publishing and performance royalties all over the world. So anytime somebody might play you in Pandora and some other place, or like I said, Deezer or one of these other platforms we don't really listen to, they'll make sure that you'll get your money. And then the last one that, that you need is Sound Exchange. So if you ever get played on the radio somewhere or something like that, they'll collect all that money. So all if you got those four, a distributor, a performing rights organization, song trust, and sound exchange, you'll be able to collect 99% of your money. Will you be able to keep up with it? No, this is why you pay them. You can try to track down everywhere in the world is playing your music, how much they owe you. Bro, that's a full-time job. That's yeah. why they got these companies that got that. And you pay them their fee, and they're going to get you 99% of, of your money. And unless you just want to sell the music directly off your website on some digital copy shit, and that's it, you're not going to get all your money from your music. It's just just how it is. It's just too convoluted. So mm-hmm. get those four things and you should be good. Hey, gems, like you said, my hey, brother. Appreciate I, you yeah. for uh, educating us hey, on that. I even want to dive deeper with it. So like with, with all these services that's doing this, because I know it's the streaming era. Now you said like, you, unless you're selling digital copies on your website, you're not really getting all your money. Like with streaming, can you break down how streaming works and like how monetization actually goes on with that? Because I'm pretty sure that's some convoluted shit right there. So Spotify, I'm, I'm going to use them because we all know them. Started by Daniel Eck. I think it was like 2008. And he was Swedish. And he had an idea like, you know, people are still in music. And I know I stole my fair share of music. Over there. <laughs> yeah, man. Line wire, <laughs> Frost, hey, wire, all that hey, shit. Hey, their share, all of them. And so he was like, yo, we got to, because Steve Jobs did a great thing with iTunes where he sold the tracks individually. But people, I don't, I still don't want to buy it. I want to mm-hmm. steal it. So we came up with this idea where people could stream music in some sort of hub like a cloud. Now, this is a great idea, right? You got my music, you got y'all music, but I want Jay-Z's music. I want Taylor Swift's music. I want Michael Jackson's music. So I got to go to the labels. It's three big record labels, Warner, Sony, and Universal. And yes, that's Warner Brothers, even though they sold their music arm, Sony PlayStation, Universal Studios. That's who owns all the music, basically. And he told them their idea. They're like, cool, we like it. What are you going to give us? I mean, what do you want? Well, you want our music. What are you going to give us? So he gave up equity stake. So all three of the major labels had equity stake in Warner. I mean, Warner, Sony, and Universal inside of Spotify. Hmm. So when he did that, right, what they did is, like, okay, now since we have equity stake, we have an incentive to give you our artist's music. But whenever some, a song gets played, someone gets paid. Streaming didn't have any legislation at the time. Eh, do we really want to be paying our artists for a service that we own? No. The label's always trying to find a way to fuck the artists. So that's why that streaming rate is 0.00 whatever cents because they made it so low for what a stream is actually valued. And so that's what artists get paid. So every a million streams for artists is around $4,000. Now, I think since then, I think Sony sold their share and some artists got paid off of that when they did. They sold a share of Spotify. I think Universal and Warner, and Warner still have a uh, stake in it. But it's pretty much like the finances of streaming. Um, and Spotify gets that money to pay from subscriptions, from ads, and all that stuff. But that's why if you go look at Spotify's financials, they've been, they've been struggling. They've been mm-hmm. in, the, in the red for a while. But that's why they make such a push on podcasting. They ain't got to pay no royalties for no podcasts. 
Mm-hmm. Like we don't get royalty checks for our podcast. So that's why we'll sign Joe Rogan. We'll sign Michelle Obama because they, I don't want to say they want to get out of the music game, but it's kind of like with grocery stores. I don't know if y'all know this eggs lose grocery stores money, but you got to have eggs to bring people into the store. Yeah. Eggs lose grocery, grocery stores money. They break, they cheat. Yeah. But you got to have them because people come in and they'll buy other stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's what Spotify is kind of doing. We have Taylor Swift's music. We got Drake's music. But y'all also going to be here. Y'all going to listen to podcasts, too. And if y'all listen to y'all podcasts for an hour, they'll make more money off of that than they ever will if you listen to Drake's song for Man. 60 seconds. Man, that that was a concept that Joe Budden introduced to me that I never really thought about, like, with podcasting. And I didn't realize that that was a, a big difference between the podcast industry and the music industry. They just paying upfront fees, and then they just own it outright. Yep. Man. Instead of having to pay them royalties, man. Because there's, there's very little legislation when it comes to this podcast game so far. Like you said, there's not much going on. It's a new space, generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. So, same with social media. That's why I keep telling people what, what y'all doing, what I'm doing, this is great. Because eventually, like our kids, they won't have the freedom to make content like this. Because the legislation hasn't caught up yet. Mm-hmm. But eventually it will. And eventually social media is going to have the legislation like TV, like movie, like we, we can't go on ABC right now and have this and be cussing and nah, the FCC nah. would, would rip us a new one. You know what I'm Hell saying? Yeah. But now we can do it. Eventually, that's how social media is going to be. So whoever puts out the most content is going to build the biggest brand. And just like I've said it again, whenever a song gets played, somebody gets paid. It's going to get to the point, whenever this podcast episode gets played, Y'all gonna get paid. You damn no matter right. what. So that's I why shit. <laughs> exactly. You gotta, you gotta keep your bastards. You gotta keep your bastards. And this is something for all my influencers. I want y'all to think about this too. Eventually, it's gonna get to the point where we we need to charge for interviews and not an upfront fee. I need 50% of all the advertising money going forward. Not not with y'all, but I'm just saying down the line, because if I'm Beyonce, no matter who I interview with, they ain't coming to see you. Yeah. They come to see me. So why doesn't Beyonce get, if I was her, I need 80% of all future advertising money forever in perpetuity until the world blows up, until the aliens come here and Will Smith got to defend us, nigga. I need that money. And that's how you got to start thinking. Like, because we ain't doing this for the next 10 years. Our great, 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 great grandchildren are going to be listening to this right now. Like my seven generations from now, they listen to Paul Paul Dorian right now. And I hope that y'all listen to everything I said and y'all ain't fuck my money up. But that's that's what we got to start thinking. Like, black people, we has got to go further because going back to, to Joseph Seagram's, he thought about that shit, which is why mm-hmm. his descendants bought basically bought Death Row. And now Death Row is owned by Hasbro. Mr. Potato Head owns what? Death Row. Yeah. Right? yeah. Man. Crazy but shit, man. Like you said, that foresight, thinking about it on a deeper level, when it comes to ownership. And that's why I love what you do with your brand, bro. And I have one more term I want you to break down for the music industry for no us, doubt, my man. brother. The 360 contract. <laughs> man. We always hear about it, but I don't know what the fuck it means. I just know if you have one of those, you are getting with no grease. Man, so what happened back in the day was like, you know, like Whitney Houston, like they, they rest in peace. Like they own her master's. Um, Whitney wrote summer songs, but not a lot. So they own the own the publishing. But when Whitney went on tour, when Whitney did movies, they didn't care. Whitney Houston was going diamond. She was she's the greatest voice of all time. They didn't care. And then Napster happened. Mm. And Napster allowed us to steal the music. Mm. So if we're still in the music, you ain't getting no royalties. Your publishing don't mean shit because I'm getting the music and you not you don't know who's keeping track of it. So the record labels, they were about to go down. Like, that's why they sued Napster. They were suing college kids because it was about to be over. And so what they said was like, how in the fuck are we going to make some money? <laughs> well, you motherfuckers going on tour. We paying for the tour. All right, we need your tour money. What else you doing on tour? Are you selling merch? Oh, we need some of that merch money. Oh, you got to deal with Sprite? We need that. Oh, well, technically the reason, Whitney, that you were in the bodyguard, I'm just using her, I don't know if she was in a 360 deal or not. But the reason you were in the bodyguard is because we made you so goddamn famous. Mm. So technically, you owe us a piece of that too. You know what? This is what we're going to do. Anybody who signs with us, we need a piece of any money you make 
ever. Because we made your ass famous. And once again, I'm a nigga in the hood. I'm sharing draws with my brother. You're going to give me $100,000? You're going to take a future revenue from when I'm in movies? Nigga, I'm in movies. Who cares? But eventually, we got more sophisticated and we realized, God damn, 360 deal. I'm legit a slave. Like, mm -hmm. anything I do, they, they get a piece of it. Man. Hey, I, thank you for that, because people need to understand that, especially, like, when it comes to music and ownership, just, like, yeah, the label, they can make you hot, but you don't want them to have a hand on everything, because nah. eventually, like, at one point, like, they could say they made you hot, but you still the motherfucker that made the music. You Swear still the one that built that connection with your fan base, and now they getting to reap the benefits. So I think I heard you say that somebody great granddaughter I just snorting coke off somebody yeah. dick in college because of Where? that shit. Like, yeah. That's, man, when I was at IU, man, I used to wonder how these girls was 20 years old driving G-wagons and shit, and they got the most expensive apartment on campus. They great granddaddy owned somebody masses. He probably got it on some random deal on some random shit. Like, we got to stop giving all that away. Like, it's kind of like if um, if the NBA came to LeBron was like, yeah, we made you, we gave you all your money, essentially, which got you the Nike money, which got you the Gatorade money, and we see you invested in this Blaze piece and you took 10%, or oh, we need a piece of that. LeBron be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Get out of here. He's not giving you that. But if he was a rapper, he had a 360 deal, what are you going to say? He ain't got no choice. I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my line unless it's money on the phone.